final unit, psychological problems. All right, so we started by looking at an introduction to mental health. Um, so we looked at um, how the numbers and figures to do with mental health problems, how those have changed over time. Um, and we would then start to look at the idea that uh, the increased challenges of modern living uh, may well lead to that um, change in the numbers of people that would now say they experience mental health problems. Okay, so remember anxiety is the biggest mental health issue that people have. We often kind of think it's things like depression and eating disorders, um, but eating disorders is actually 1.6 in 100 people. Um, so there are also cultural variations in mental health problems. Um, so what we may see as abnormal behaviour, other people will see as normal and think that we are the weird ones for doing things. Um, uh, so, yeah, eating disorders, you didn't really see outside of Western culture for a very long time. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of this idea um, as well of like hearing voices is perfectly acceptable in some cultures, but in others you're uh, a bit of a schizophrenic. All right, so how do we actually recognise uh, what are mental health issues? Um, so there are certain signs and symptoms that people are looking for. So maybe undesirable behaviour, things like not being able to sleep, not wanting to get out of bed in the morning, not wanting to go to work, uh, not socialising with other people. Um, of course, you know, there are problems with that because you haven't necessarily got a mental health issue if you don't want to do all of those things. However, um, we do have a much better recognition now of what are mental health health issues. Okay, you've got M Marie Jehoda's list um, where she talks about six categories that are characteristics of being mentally healthy, right? So if you've got high self-esteem, um, if you are aware of your capabilities, you can cope with stressful situations, you can be independent, you can calm yourself down, self-regulate yourself if you're upset about things. Um, you actually do have an accurate perception of reality and what's going on. Uh, and you um, also function well within your environment. So you have people that you love, you do your job well, you have good relationships with other people. All right, so finally then, there is also that lessening of social stigma. Okay, so now if you say, um, you know, I've got a psychological problem or I go to a psychiatrist, people are far more accepting. Um, it used to be this idea in the past that, uh, you know, you couldn't get proper insurance and all sorts of things if you uh, were proved to have some sort of mental health I issue. So we've then gone on to look at the effects of mental health problems. All right, so we can have damaged relationships, whether that's with your friends, with your family, okay, because you may become withdrawn, you may become difficult to get to communicate, you may uh, not want to go out and socialise with people. So that then results in this difficulty of coping with day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, you know, you may think that it's perfectly healthy to go home, not want to talk to people for 12 hours in a day. Um, and that might be that you are, um, you know, an introverted type of person, but you also need to be able to... Um, uh, function within society okay so hold down a job do the things that are expected of you um, it, all of this can have a negative impact on your physical well-being right if you're having difficulties coping with daily life then everything becomes much more stressful you might find it difficult to sleep or you want to sleep for ex extensive amounts of time, right? So therefore, um, your immune system starts to um, uh, become deficient uh, because it's not getting the stimulation that it needs and, um, you know, it starts to collapse. Okay, there are social effects. We need more social care to deal with uh, people who are not able to 
uh, look after themselves. Um, there is an increase in the crime rate. Remember, that is often uh, over-exaggerated, though, so we need to be careful. Um, and there are implications for the economy. If I'm going to have to take a lot of days off because I've got stress and I or depression and I can't come into work, that then has a knock-on effect for the economy. All right, then we have to look at different types of depression. Okay, so we would have what we call clinical depression. So there is a difference between sadness and depression. Sadness is perfectly normal, um, but depression is an abnormal emotional response. Okay, so you, it's when you feel sad about everything. Um, and there isn't always necessarily a clear cause for how that has happened, right? Um, so we need to know what's the difference between normality and abnormality. And you know that we will say, okay, I'm, I'm going to pull myself out of this. Sometimes it's quite nice to feel a bit sad. You know, why do we watch a film that makes us cry? right because we quite enjoy that emotional thing but then you're over it and you move on okay but um it it becomes depression when you can't get away from that feeling and it's disabling you it's stopping you from doing the things that you you want to do and the person you want to be okay so we talked about unipolar depression um so this is where you're only experiencing one emotional state, such as depression. Um, okay, and sorry, I'm just looking across. Oh, okay, that's on the next page. Um, so if we look at uh, bipolar depression, um, so this is where you might change between two different moods or, stre or um, states. So normally depression and mania, right? So mania where you're very frenzied, you want to do everything very fast, very, um, you know, and do it as, just as quickly as you can and as often as you can, right? But then you will go into a depressive state where you just can't do anything. All right, so the way to diagnose this uh, is to look for certain symptoms. So there is the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD. Remember, we are on uh, version 10 at the moment. Um, so they would say that mild unipolar depression has to have two or three key symptoms. Uh, five or six is considered moderate depression. And for um, a full diagnosis of depression, um, they've got to be present uh, all or most of the time and they should persist for longer than uh, two weeks. So that's if you have got seven or more uh, of these, right? So the key symptoms are low mood, loss of interest and pleasure, reduced energy levels. Those are your three key symptoms. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean... You might be a bit lethargic, uh, but some people just can't even drag themselves out of bed, right? Things that you used to enjoy doing, suddenly they bring nothing to you. You don't, you don't want to do them. Um, you know, we all get low moods, but some people are always very tearful. Um, they may have this sense of hopelessness. They can't see any point in continuing on. The other symptoms will be changes in sleep patterns, uh, as I said before, changes in your appetite level, whether that's eating more or uh, eating less, uh, decrease in your self-confidence, right? So your self-esteem is not by everything. Um, we can also have reduced concentration and attention, ideas of guilt and unworthiness, uh, bleak and pessimistic views of the future, and then, of course, the idea of self-harm or suicide, which is when it is really getting... Uh, quite difficult. Um, so if you remember, we had a go at diagnosing some of the differences to see uh, whether we could tell if a person was depressed or whether they were sad. All right, then we went on to look at some biological explanations for depression. So one could be an imbalance of neurotransmitters. Um, so then uh, the idea is that serotonin 
um, is transmitted from one neuron to another. And if there's plenty of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, the message is transmitted, postsynaptic neuron is stimulated, and that leads to an improved mood. So what we need to do is get more serotonin into somebody uh, because it also affects your memory, your sleep, your, uh, your appetite as well. Um, so uh, you could have uh, low levels of serotonin because it's genetic and you know you inherit a poor ability um, it could be your environment um, so uh, it, because if your diet is low in uh, tryptophan then it could be that you need to include um, protein levels uh, to include your uh, increase your amount of serotonin okay if there is research to support this um, however it is a weakness because we don't know if the biological explanation uh, is an effect of being depressed or if it's a cause of being depressed um, and then another weakness is that there are um, alternative explanations so it might not just be uh, abnormal levels of neurotransmitters that uh, cause depression so then we went on to look at psychological explanations so now we're looking at a cognitive approach um, so we would see somebody has faulty thinking right so this is that cup half empty idea of things um, so if you remember we tried to find uh, like the negative way that somebody would look at a good uh, event happening to them so what they do is they build up these negative schemas right so um, they only see things from their own perspective and um, we don't look at what anybody else is feeling uh, and we see it all as a negative thing on us right everybody hates me um, so then we go on to attributions um, so we are talking about the causes of behavior um, so we um, we try to give explanations for why they are doing the thing, for the, why people are doing the things that you're doing. Um, and we think that that explains um, their behavior. Yeah. So uh, we might have a depressive or negative attributional style. So we say things like, it's all my fault, I'm stupid. So that's an internal attribution. People will never like me again. That's a stable attribution. And everything I do goes wrong. That's a global attribution, right? So we have things that are inside us where we're blaming ourselves for things, right? I'm, I'm never going to know how to parallel park because I've got no sense of perspective, right? That's a that's an internal attribution that I've given to myself, right? Um, but then we have other ones where it's it's more global, where we think that every single thing that we do is wrong, or we we have a stable one where we're looking at people around us and we think that is never going to change. There is nothing I can do that is ever going to change that. Right now, there could be a big influence of nurture on here. So Seligman suggested um, that negative attitudes uh, and attributional styles are often learned. Um, so if they move away from a, a toxic environment, a negative environment, that can change everything. So evaluation of this is that there is a lot of support uh, for learned helplessness. There's lots of other research that goes with it. It has a really good real world application. Um, however, those negative beliefs that somebody have might actually be a realistic view of the world. Um, and so we have to be aware that it's, it's not necessarily not the right way to be thinking. Uh, so then we looked at therapies for, no, hold on, yes, then we looked at therapies for depression. So next we looked at antidepressant medication. So we looked at selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. Okay, so this is the idea of targeting serotonin um, at the synapse and then inhibiting the reuptake of the serotonin. Um, yep, that's 
pretty much it. Um, however, there's a negative to this. There are um, side effects to uh, taking this type of antidepressant medication, uh, which can actually be worse than the depressant. Um, so, for example, some people have become addicted to uh, the medication. In some cases, it increases suicidal thought. Um, and there is questionable evidence for the effectiveness of the use of these drugs. Um, and then it's also a very reductionist approach Right. It's not taking into account that there could be other factors that are causing the depression. So then we went on to look at cognitive behaviour therapy. OK, so here we have this idea that um, what a person has to do is get to the point where they are thinking about what they are doing and they learn techniques that help them to recognise that behaviour and to turn that cognitive thought round from a negative into a positive. Um, so a therapist has to deal with the irrational thoughts um, that a person has by keep challenging those. Um, and then eventually the client will start to deal with those irrational thoughts as well. Um, evaluation of this is that there is a, a, a lot better uh, lasting effectiveness with CBT. Um, often with uh, SSRIs, it might be effective short term, but long term, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody wants to explain all of their thoughts and feelings, whatever else. However, it is a very holistic approach. It's not reductionist. It takes into account all sorts of triggers that could have set off that depression. All right, next we went on to Wiles's study. Um, so this is a named study in the specification. Um, so uh, this, it, what he wanted, uh, not he, Nicola Wiles, what she wanted to do um, was to investigate the benefits of a holistic approach um, to treating people with treatment resistant depression. Um, compared to just using antidepressant treatment on its own. Okay, so she used what was called cobalt, which is cognitive behaviour therapy as an adjunct to medication for treatment resistant depression. Um, so she got 469 participants uh, from different areas of the UK. They came from 73 different GP practices. They'd all been, uh, they'd all had uh, treatment resistant depression. Um, they'd all been taking medication for more than six weeks. Um, and then they were put into two conditions using a computer generated code. So some were given their usual care of only antidepressants and others were given their usual care plus CBT. So they had about 12 to 18 sessions. The results were after six months that 422 of the participants remained in the study uh, and it, with usual care only 21.6% had more than 50% reduction in symptoms but it was 46.1% uh, when it was usual care and CBT. Um, and at the end of 12 months the levels of recovery were better in the second group. Um, so the conclusion was that the uh, that uh, obviously the benefits are with a holistic approach, uh, and that it's maintained over a longer period of time as well. Okay, so evaluation of this is a very well designed study. You try to control extraneous variables. Um, uh, it, negatively, though, it, it's only using self-report methods to determine the levels of depression. So uh, these could be wildly inaccurate, um, but it does have a real world application. So that's really good. Then we went on to look at addiction. OK, so what's the difference between dependence and addiction? Um, so it's when so, for example, when somebody starts taking pain medication, not to get rid of their pain, which is just a dependence, but because it gives them a buzz. So now it's become an addiction because you're not using it for 
um, what it was actually meant for. Um, and then we looked at the difference between misuse and abuse of, um, of medication. So quite often people won't take the right dosages or they'll stop taking medication before uh, before they should because they feel okay, right? So there's, there's, you know, lots of people do that. Um, but and, and a misuse could be using a drug for the wrong things. Um, so um, taking antidepressants to help you lose weight would be uh, the sort of thing we're thinking about. Um, but um, once you start using something to experience euphoria or to get high um, or um, to kind of escape from everything around you, then this is when it becomes abuse, right? If you are trying to modify your mood, then that's, that's abuse of um, a substance. Okay, so ways to diagnose um, addiction. Again, we're using the ICD-10. Um, so one is a strong desire to use the substance. You just, you can't get away from it. Like my uncle who couldn't stop smoking. He, would, he had hypnosis, came out afterwards, lit up a cigarette. He had acupuncture, came out afterwards, lit up a cigarette, right? He enjoyed smoking. Um, persisting despite harm, okay, and ultimately he died from throat cancer um, from where he'd been smoking so much, yeah. Um, difficulty in controlling use, he would tell us he only smoked 20 a day, but we'd see him smoke 20 in the course of three or four hours, so we knew it was a lot more than that. Um, high priority given to the substance, yeah, when he was asleep and I stole his, stole his cigarettes once, I thought he was going to kill me when he woke up. Um, a withdrawal state, if you don't have them, what sort of state do you then go into? Um, and then um, this idea of tolerance. So, you know, you maybe smoke because you enjoy it, uh, but then, and you maybe only have <clears throat> one or two when you're out having a drink with your friends, but then it becomes something that has to happen more and more frequently because you, you can't get away from it. Okay, so then we went on to look at the biological explanation. So we're thinking about the difference of nature genes. So are there hereditary factors? Um, and do we have genetic vulnerability through those genes? Now, this is our final named study. Um, so this is the CAGE twin study of alcohol abuse. So if you recall, um, uh, Cage was looking at whether alcoholism is explained by hereditary factors. Um, so he studied uh, male twins from Skan in Sweden, and uh, they'd come from the Temperance Board registration data. 310 male twins were identified where at least one twin was registered. Um, so he interviewed them, um, and sometimes he interviewed their close relatives to get information out of them. Um, and he also looked at the classifications of the twins. Um, so <clears throat> he looked to see whether they were MZ, uh, which is monozygotic, okay, so identical, or DZ called dizygotic, which means they, uh, they're they not from the same uh, fertilized egg cell. They're two different fertilized eggs. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, 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 don't need to worry about that. Um, okay, so where you had both twins registered, it was significantly higher in the MZ twins. 61% uh, of the identical twins were both alcoholic, whereas only 39% are the non-identical. Um, they also, also those with social problems uh, were overrepresented. So the data suggests that alcoholism is related to, her, uh, to hereditary factors. Um, however, it does say if it was totally hereditary, then you would expect it to be 100% in the MZ. Um, twins and it isn't. Um, so it does suggest that there could be environmental factors that come into play. <coughs> so evaluations of this 
and the negative it is quite a flaw it's flawed in its design of the study and um, it has been supported by later research though um, and there is also um, this misunderstanding of what genetic vulnerability uh, could mean um, so it, it's misleading to only lay it at the feet of biology Okay, so if we then look at psychological explanations, we can see things like peer influence, right? So then we look at social learning theory. Albert Bandura looks at this idea um, that we learn things from other people and the world around us, and these affect our behaviour. So what are the social norms? If we can't fit in with them, do we feel bad about that? Um, so if all of our friends are smoking, do we smoke? If all of our friends are drinking, swearing, do we do those things as well, right? And this goes in with the social identity theory. So we want to be liked, so we do those things that other people want us to do. And there's that pressure to conform to those norms. And what that does is it creates opportunities for addictive behaviour. All right, so we might... Um, start smoking because our friends do and they might be able to give it up but we can't and we are then stuck with the addiction All right so there is supporting research um, to back up this idea of peer influence through nurture um, however it may be peer selection um, so it doesn't always work in a, a negative way peers can also have a positive influence on us um, however, positive of that is that it is a real world application. All right, so then we looked at therapies for addiction. So we looked at aversion therapy. Okay, so obviously aversion is to do with classical conditioning. Um, and the idea is that we look at associations with addictions um, and we try to give the addiction something unpleasant that it's associated with so people will then stop doing it. Okay, so with the treating of alcoholism, um, it's this idea of being given a drug that makes them feel sick when they have a drink. With the treating of uh, gambling, uh, then they would uh, be given phrases uh, that pointed towards the negatives and uh, whatever. So when they read those negative phrases, they were given an electric shock um, and they were all to do with gambling. Whereas when they read things that were everyday normal activities, they didn't get an electric shock. So they wanted to do those and not do gambling anymore. Um, and then with uh, treating smoking, then you have the intensive smoking so that you become disgusted by it. All right, so a weakness is that um, people may abandon this therapy. Okay, obviously, aversion therapy is not nice. Uh, it doesn't make anybody feel good. Uh, and it does have very poor long-term effectiveness. So it might work in the short term, but doesn't seem to be sustained. Um, however, uh, it is a holistic approach. You can put it with CBT, and then it will be far more effective. Finally, then we looked at self-management uh, and we went through this idea of the 12-step recovery program, which is best known through Alcoholics Anonymous, but is used for uh, many different addictive um, problems. Uh, so there's this idea of a higher power that we have to surrender to, we have to admit and share guilt, and this is a lifelong process. So remember, it's not steps up, it's kind of steps in an ongoing sequence um, with this idea that, um, you know, you might drop out on one, but you then work to move uh, move back and, and cover that idea again right and just because one thing falls apart it doesn't mean everything has fallen apart right so you can just move on with that um so self-help groups are um 
set up so that people who have all had addictions can talk to each other and support each other right because the idea is that if you've been through it people will empathize with what you are saying and and they will be able to help you far more and you will listen to someone who actually knows what you're experiencing rather than maybe if you've got family and friends who've never had those sorts of addictions you you know you you will find yourself constantly saying you don't know how i feel so therefore it's not it's not going to help so self-help groups really help um evaluation of this is that there is a lack of clear evidence um so we we can't really be certain how effective the 12 step program is um obviously there's a lot of anonymity that goes into these groups and um you're probably only really going to hear about the success stories um there are going to be individual differences in this certain types of people are going to find this a better method to use um however it is a holistic approach the 12 steps focus on everything in a person's life uh, not just uh, one thing that might have been a trigger or caused this addiction and there it is revision complete